When open prayers are heard, even in churches, not for the persecuted, but for the persecutors. At this point, moral responsibility passes into the hands of individuals, or more accurately, into the hands of any still unbroken individuals. All right, so we're back to do our third episode on Ernst Jünger's The Forest Passage. So we did two shows on it already. Oh yeah, there's the German version. <laughs> Very nice. And I read in the I think in the first episode we were you were talking Luke about how the the trans the translation um like in German it's more like Forest Walker, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I I finally, after finishing the book, I went back and I read the translator's preface. So he gives his his reasons for uh, for choosing the two words forest passage and forest rebel. So in Oimusfil, his novel from uh, 1977, uh, Jünger's novel, he also talks about the forest passage. And in the translation by a different guy who did that, he translated it as, as the forest flight and the forest fleer and this translator decided not to go with that because he thought it would be a he thought the word flight had the had the um like brought brought to, to mind the image of like a fearful running away like almost a, a passive um yeah a passive fearful running away so he thought that um that the forest passage carried the the dual meanings of the German, because in German it's either, it's either like I think he said it's either it can be read as either being in the forest or walking into the forest. Yeah, would that be? Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's, that's correct. Yeah. I, I actually liked Forest Passage. I like mm -hmm. the the translation, but the Forest Rebel, I am not so sure. <laughs> yeah, he and uh, the reason he chose that, um, well, to avoid saying Forest Fleer, he just went with. Um, I think the way that they, the translators had translated it in like uh, Italian and Spanish or something like that, or French and Spanish, uh, who, they just translated it as rebel. But um, he liked the rebel. Yeah, for the actor's name, I chose to compromise between Neugroschel's Forest Fleer, oh, just hold on a sec. Which retains forest and the French and Italian translators who simply use rebel, um, which this figure certainly also is. So yeah, rebel probably not the best word, but uh, but kind of works. Maybe he should but, have uh, translated it to the forest hero, uh, which may may sound a little lofty, but um, hero being this archetype that uh, he is suggesting is um, possible. I, I kind of see what you mean, Luke, when you have um, okay. reservations about uh, rebel, or maybe the the forest resistance. Well, it's just not an accurate translation, is all I think. As in the resistance. But why not forest um, walker? Does, doesn't that make sense in English? I mean, it's it maybe doesn't have this equal, like the exact dual meaning as the German, but it's kind of a literal translation and. To to me, it kind of makes sense, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't really have any. Uh, well, the forest rebel kind of brings to mind an image that the forest walker doesn't. Um, you know, you could explain what forest walker means by reading the book, but by itself, it just kind of sounds like um, um, like a hiker. You know. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, the German word. Um, it is, I mean, yeah, it is, it is the, the, that word that he uses, right? Like mm -hmm. Walker and, uh, uh, yeah. So it, it, it kind of makes sense to me. I mean, it's like, but it suggests, uh, walking the path, I think, mm -hmm. and that there is a, yeah. a pathway to be, because the whole thing is a metaphor anyway. Right. So, yeah. um, it's not that, I mean, we understand that he's not talking about like hiking trips. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And rebel is just, you know, it's, it's just this, uh, from, to me, it has, has these connotations of like armed rebellion or like, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a, a red, uh, red 
underground army, <laughs> like fighting the fascists, uh, you know, like in the, like some partisan force, or something like that. Mm -hmm. like, but yeah, yeah. Well, b well, just uh, before we move on from <laughs> from the <laughs> from these nitpicks, I think that's uh, well. It's not the translators in um, preface, but in the introduction by Russell Berman, um, he pointed out. He, oh, where was it? He wrote something like that the guys that the guys that Younger had in wow. mind when writing this kind of were were those types, right? Um, oh, I didn't I didn't underline that part of it, but basically, like the uh, you know he well he didn't use the example of Robin Hood, but that's kind of the 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 type that he had in mind. At least that's what the that's what Behrman, um argued you know i think it's not quite as clear i think he was probably a bit more uh um maybe not limited to those types but maybe was just inspired by them but anyways we can we can leave that um let me hear what uh let's just do a little test adam say something hello 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 okay yeah no we can hear you guys yeah that works Okay. But so I wanted to focus on the last um just like the last 10 pages almost like 10 12 pages of the book. We covered most of the the rest in our other two episodes, but some of the some of what I found to be the most um the most interesting ideas are in just a few of these final little sections. And the first bit has to do with well they all kind of tie in together. There's several ideas that kind of weave through well, two or three of these last sections and the idea of crime, um, morality, and I'd say crime, morality, and then totalitarianism in general, or, you know, pathocracy might be a better way of putting it. But it starts in in uh, section 20, 29, where I think this is the one, which section is this? 29 is the one on arms, so on weapons. But in that context, he writes, in this regard, a special danger lies in the infiltration of criminal elements. The forest rebel may not fight according to martial law, but neither does he fight like a bandit. Just as little can his form of discipline be called military. This presupposes uh, strong, direct self-leadership. So he introduces that idea of not being a criminal, which he then expands on in the next um in the next section in a couple of the next sections so for instance he writes that in the forest passage we are forced to come to uh forced to come to terms with crises in which neither law nor custom will remain standing during these crises similar patterns to similar patterns to those described at the outset for elections will become apparent the masses will follow the propaganda, which shifts them into a purely technical relationship with law and morality. Not so the forest rebel. He has a tough decision to make, to reserve the right at any cost to judge for himself what he is called upon to support or contribute to. There will be considerable sacrifices, but they will be accompanied by an immediate gain in sovereignty. Naturally, as things stand, only a tiny minority will perceive the gain as such. Dominion, however, can only come from those who have preserved in themselves a knowledge of native human measures, and who will not be forced by any superior power to forsake acting humanely. So, in the first bit, he says, okay, well, we fight, but we don't fight like criminals. Here he, gets, he says, we fight, but we won't be forced to take, um, we basically won't forsake our own humanity to be to behave inhumanely. And then in the next section, he writes something very similar. Um, let's see. Yeah, so <clears throat> he says, in opposing this, so I guess the opposing the propaganda, um, oh, well, this will tie into this will tie into uh, what he has to say about totalitarianism in general, but 
in oppose, I'll, we'll skip that for now. So he says, in opposing this, it is critical for the forest rebel to clearly differentiate between himself, uh, clearly differentiate himself from the criminal, not only in his morals, in how he does battle, and in his social relations, but also by keeping these differences alive and strong in his own heart. In a world where the existing legal and constitutional doctrines do not put the necessary tools in his hands, he can only find right within himself. We learn what needs to be defended much sooner from poets and philosophers. So that's the first just kind of idea that I that was I saw threaded through these final chapters. And it's one that he, well, it has to do, it, it ties in perfectly with Ponderology, I thought, because he's basically describing, the, the opposite that he's describing would be Ponderization. It's this process where this rebel group will essentially forsake their humanity, start acting like criminals, and then be no better than, you know, the, the so-called tyranny that they are allegedly fighting against. And I think that's a lesson that pretty much every social movement or um, rebel group needs to take to heart that, well, and it's one that, you know, I've just reading online, I see a lot of people ignoring that advice or not being aware of it. It's like, well, if this is what our enemies do, then we have to do exactly the same thing and we have to be even better at it. And that's perfectly fine for perhaps for winning, for taking power, but, you know, what do you lose in the process? I don't know. Did you guys? Did you guys notice those? Did you have any thoughts on that? Well, I didn't. I didn't think of it. Um, now that you pointed out the this thread of ponderization and the uh, the risk and the danger of falling prey prey to pathology in an effort to uh, fight one's enemies is a very real risk and I think an important thing that Younger points out there. Um, the other thing that stuck out to me in those passages uh, was the resemblance to Gurdjieff's idea of conscience, which is something that he uh, encouraged in his students and in people who read his work, this kind of struggle with one's innermost core um, values and and morals that would not be uh, expedient all the time to follow. Um, basically, you know, following a, a one's conscience in a, in a very difficult situation uh, is and can be a, a big struggle. Uh, Junger talks a lot about sacrifice and shedding one's uh, material identification and comfort in order to embody uh, the values of, of one's conscience, even though he doesn't use the word. Um, so that was mostly what I got out of those passages in particular, that there is this inducement, encouragement to uh, to be clear on what the struggle is and to see the struggle for what it is and to identify your own uh, position uh, and your own um, thoughts and what may be actions taken as a result of the struggle uh, and, and this kind of, uh, in many cases, an, an unseen uh, war um, that uh, that quiet totalitarianism or soft totalitarianism may be uh, may be occurring right under one's nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to to add to that point uh, about um, uh, a resistance force. Um, yeah, the, the danger, let's say, that it becomes the thing that it fights. Right, the polarization process. Um, and Jünger says uh, also at one point, which I found kind of interesting, that um, that resistance doesn't necessarily always have to be like open in the sense of like a direct confrontation, right? Um, and he says that sometimes that can 
yeah, that can basically mean handing over the tyrant a list of the dissidents, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's a, a certain danger um, and there's also a certain strength in in moderation in certain situations. And uh, I think that's that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, recognizing the danger of that kind of, um, let's say, uh, an eye for an eye approach. And he also said um, that it's the, the favorite theory of those who are not involved is that everybody needs to be in open resistance, right? Uh, so it's easy to say, uh, but uh, there are inherent dangers in it. He also doesn't say that, obviously, that it's never uh, warranted. Uh, so he he even gives some tactical <laughs> advice, you know, like how, where to, which bridges to blow up and and that sort of thing. Um, so he's not uh, necessarily against any of that, but he has a very nuanced take that says sometimes it's better not to do it, right? And uh, and if you do it, um, uh, then you you kind of need to discover that that inner core spiritual core in you basically and and grow uh grow along those lines and uh i think maybe what he's uh saying and this is certainly true i think and we can see that from experience is that once the moral order kind of collapses you have basically basically uh new energies coming in and it can go both ways right so you have on the one hand uh you have that um total like basically psychopathic gangs roaming right so that that sort of thing and this hardcore um polarization process um and uh, on the other hand you also have the potential to for those the, the forest rebels right to to rediscover their their freedom and their inner strength and a lot in that final sections i thought was about that right this uh process to read of rediscovering um a, a higher core uh, something deeper uh in the face of um of uh of great uh, adversity and and a collapse of of the moral order basically uh and uh, you can see that i think if if you have say like a sound but very rigid moral order in a society it it has both positive and negative effects right so the positive effect is that you can kind of keep the 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 worst elements in check uh, but the negative effect is also that those who are forest rebels at heart right they they will they will be limited and uh, no moral order can like uh, really be perfect in that sense and so i found that interesting this idea that once everything collapses so to say um you have these both both these direction where where it can go mm -hmm. the, um Oh well, I'll tie I'll tie some of the things b both of you guys said together um, about conscience, and then this the rediscovering the inner. Well, well, first before before connecting those, uh, I want to say something really quick on what you how you started that, Luke, and um, reading the introduction because I haven't read Oymusville yet, but um, or actually reading the preface. So the guy that translated it into English said that he had read Oymusville first which was written in 1977, so like over 25 years later. And he makes reference to the forest rebel, or the forest walker in that book, but just briefly and just passing references. And so this guy, he said, even though that he was in like a study group in, in where was it, Florence or Venice or something, um, he hadn't understood what the forest rebel was, um, you know, until he translated this book. And the I, the but there are links between the the forest rebel and what in um, in Oymusville is he calls the anarch, it's not the anarchists but the but the anarch and the the two figures are very similar and I think that the I don't know for sure because I haven't read Oymusville and and uh, there was you know just brief very brief description in the in the preface but I get the impression that the the anarch is the one who can be um, specifically, you know, can live in any place at any time to be fully within their, um, within their, how did he, well, maybe I can find how he put it, um, how the translator put it. 
Yeah. So he says, naturally, the forest rebel does not seek, or the forest rebel does seek to escape oppression. And being comparatively weaker than the anarch, he must flee society to some extent, while the anarch can remain concealed and wholly within it. But so yes. that's. But the things in, in the forest passage, he also talks about that, right? Mm -hmm. About like uh, being hi hidden behind, uh, you know, if you live in, in a big city and you have a normal profession and you kind of stay hidden, right? As a And that you can do it everywhere. And so I, I haven't read Oymysville yet, So, but I just wouldn't think that the contrast is that stark, right? Yeah. I, and I and I think that we'd probably have to read Oymysville to see if what this guy is saying, you know, makes sense. That maybe there is a maybe there is a a distinction, or maybe it's maybe it's just not as clear. Because I, I remember he does say that in here, but maybe um, I don't know. Maybe he just clears it up a bit more in Oymysville because um, I got the impression from the translator that that he sees maybe he sees the uh, the forest rebel as more of a um, more of an actual militant, but, but I don't know. I might be, I might be misrepresenting him. Um, however, the, well, I'll just read the next sentence. He writes, he says, however, the terms of comparison at the time Junger conceived the figure of the Waldganger, <laughs> uh, Waldganger. Waldganger <laughs> were not, were not the as yet unborn anarch and his qualities, but the masses, and political anarchists, oh, this is the thing I was thinking about previously, but the masses and political activists, anarchists, and partisans. So he's saying that when he wrote Forest Passage, those were the figures he had more in mind, like the political activists, anarchists, and partisans that kind of inspired the idea of the Forest Passage or the, the Forest Fleer or the Forest, uh, forest Rebel. So yeah, I think he probably just develops the anarch in more detail than he did the in that regard than he did the the forest rebel but yeah there's overlap for sure but even then in um i mean younger himself distinguishes them in oimisville so maybe there's just some overlap but back to the to what you guys were saying about the the kind of the kind of inner strength and what elan had said about um about conscience there's that's an, an another interesting thread that runs through it and this ties into something that i I just touched on in one of my Substack articles on the natural law and uh, and this book that I read uh, after the natural law by, I think his name's John, John Hill or something Hill, and basically gives an overview of Aquinas's view of, you know, view of the natural law and what it is. And so I'll read a couple things from these chapters. So first... So he's talking about, um, okay, so in these bad times that, okay, he says, we have already come a long way if we understand the necessity of this. Um, oh, I'll just, I'll have to read the whole paragraph. You can never just start halfway through with, uh, <laughs> with Younger. So the only consolation in this spectacle is its descending movement in a definite direction and with definite goals. Formerly, such periods were called interregnums. Today, they present themselves as our industrial landscapes. They are distinguished by a lack of ultimate validity. And we have already come a long way if we can understand the necessity of this and why it is in any event better than trying to maintain or reinstall already exhausted elements as valid options. Just as our sensibility objects to the use of Gothic forms in the modern in the machine world, so it also so it also reacts in the moral sphere. So he's basically saying things change, um, like in this situation in which the forest rebel arises, like this, um, whether it's this overt totalitarianism or a more hidden form, um, um, you know, in in so-called free countries, that the basically the old forms cease being valid options they kind of become dead and i think we talked about this in our in a previous show this could apply to you know moral systems religious systems any kind of institution how they kind of become um 
old and and fragile or old and weak and brittle and so he's saying well this is actually um it's not exactly a it's not inherently a bad thing um it, it, it makes sense if these old forms stop working then you know it'd have to find some new forms kind of but so he goes on this has already been treated in detail in our study on the world of work a person must know the rules of the territory in which they live on the other hand the evaluating consciousness remains incorruptible and this fact is at the root of the pain at the root of our perception of an unavoidable loss so this ties to something well so all this ties together i think with the natural law which is uh, like our our inner moral sense and and it's that that inner um that source of inner strength that the forest rebel gain you know regains access to so what he's taught what he's saying here the evaluating consciousness remains incorruptible so no matter no matter how things change in the world no matter what the forms change there's something deep within us that remains incorruptible and you could say that is our sense of what is good and evil of what is right or wrong on a deep level and in fact those things gain gain in importance and the like the contrast becomes um the contrast be becomes even greater so that it stands out in more detail and i think he yeah well he he also says a similar thing when he's talking about and, and you mentioned this luke um about how in in the times before these catastrophes before these these kind of bad times or evil times like the law and morality or morality is very um like dry and legalistic and it's like uh it lacks a vitality and it's and it's these times that reinvigorate it and make it regain its vitality and so that vitality is that uh, that incorruptible um evaluating consciousness and it's because of that value it's because of that evaluating consciousness that we are able to see that something's wrong I mean, this can this gets into the the kind of boring philosophical philosophical arguments for like the objectivity of morality and and whether moral values are um, socially socially constructed, if there's any objective validity to them, if they're completely subjective. Well, um, if it's just based on group consensus, so this in itself is an argument against the group consensus model because when the group when the group consensus is totally changed that in practice in actual real life that is when the like i said the contrast stands out in the most detail that's when it becomes the most obvious that something is fundamentally wrong because if if morals were just um were just created by group consensus then they would just change and there wouldn't be any reason that well there wouldn't be any reason to to feel anything negative against them and i and I can't see how the 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 reaction would be so powerful in in a person who would who would see that who would recognize that. Like he's he's pointing out that there's something deep about it that's embedded in our you know in our very nature in our very essence. And um, yeah, so it's it's tied to that awareness of the tied to that awareness of the loss that um, when that it, when that's missing in the world, it uh, it touches something deep and. It becomes that much more obvious and i've got another one here yeah. that ties in with that uh another little quote when all institutions have become equivocal or even disreputable and when open prayers are heard even in churches not for the persecuted but for the persecutors at this point moral responsibility passes into the hands of individuals or more accurately into the hands of any still unbroken individuals mm -hmm. the forest rebel is the concrete individual and he acts in the concrete world he has no need of theories or of laws concocted by some party jurist to know what is right he descends to the very springs of morality where the waters are not yet divided and directed into institutional channels mm -hmm. and i think that is you know exactly what you're talking about where he's saying uh, as things become corrupted in the external in the you know time uh sensitive institutions that it becomes more important 
or the um the oh, what's what would be the word for that like the the bearer of responsibility passes from the institutions to the individual in such instances where the institutions become corrupt then it is no longer the institution that bears weight of responsibility but rather the individuals to then make some corrective action or take some corrective action and that mm -hmm. can be completely dependent or that is completely up to the individual taking you know all things into consideration uh to see what would be the best way forward in terms of rectifying that uh that corruption mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and that passage that you read was yeah, that that was perfect. That was that was exactly exactly the the point I was making. And um, re repeat. What was your last point there? Repeat that. Um, if you can, when I remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the responsibility of, the, of the individual yeah. over the you know over the individual the the, indivi the institution loses that responsibility, and it's up to the individual individual to then take it up, right? And mm -hmm the the reason that that's possible is that because the original source of the institution mm -hmm. it's not like institutions carry carry this value in and of themselves that's kind of like divorced from the humans that make them up right the the source mm -hmm. of the original values or or purposes of any institution is from the is from the individuals um and well the individuals and the the group that that make them up and when the when the the when those individuals become cut off from that original purpose it's it's uh it's then up to more individuals and more groups to to reestablish that to reestablish that that um you know that spark that gave rise to it in the first place which is a product of their own humanity so it can only come from another human source it can only come from from new individuals and he he makes the distinction very clear just a couple pages after the that uh that bit that you read adam he says that um just makes oh i don't want to read the same one that you wrote, read okay there it is <laughs> so he says that um the figures appearing on the curtain what's the curtain oh the curtain of time which rises perpetually on the same ever recurring spectacle so the figures appearing on the curtain are not the most important point the either or face the either or facing the individual has a quite different aspect he is led to the point where a choice must be made between his directly bestowed human nature and the nature of a criminal so this ties back to the thing to the thread of criminality that he's that he's weaving um, throughout these chapters so that's the choice between so he's basically saying that there's human that that the that the criminal nature is something fundamentally against our our human nature our as he called it bestowed human nature the thing that we inherit from from god essentially from the from divinity and this ties into the to the natural law tradition of human nature and so human nature isn't just like our biology for instance because you know a biologist or a, a psychologist might say that that you know criminality is human nature too it's all human nature because it's all humanity but the um, but in, for natural law, like guys like Aquinas, or yeah, like Aquinas, that um, human nature is not, it's not just humanity as it is, it is humanity's like essence and purpose. And so when you are fulfilling essentially the human purpose, that is your, that is human nature. And that anything that would go against that purpose would be unnatural so criminality you know Jünger is basically saying here that criminality is um un unnatural in relation to, to to true human nature our bestowed human nature um at least that's how you know ha that's how i'd read it and that um but he never goes so far as to say that it's not um well, because he, you know, his his talk about the forest rebel and, you know, some of the things that he said about you know, taking a, a resistive stance against tyranny, well, mm -hmm. you know, those he rightly says is criminal or can be 
criminal mm -hmm. legalistically, depending on whatever context. So it's not so much that uh, one should never engage in anything criminal ever, but that it's mm -hmm. very well, context specific. Yeah, but at the same time, he's, well, let me read, uh, let me see. There's something he says, oh, just on the, on the next page, I believe. Um, so he's clear, like, he, uh, how to put it? Well, he's clear. This is the problem of like Orwellianism, of like Orwellian language in the sense that, and he, he talks about this at one point where he says like, it, it gets to the point where it's, it's hard to tell, a, it's hard to tell the difference between war and peace. Mm -hmm. And so of course, or, you know, Orwell's the, the famous slogan, war is peace, but things can get so messed up to the point where a peaceful situation, he, he, he talks, he mentions this a few points throughout the book that a, a society seemingly at peace it can actually underneath the surface be at war with itself. And that, so in a sense, peace is war in that sense. Um, but they can also say that it can also be twisted in, in the more Orwellian sense that actual warfare is called peace. Um, so of course, like you're saying, everything gets mixed up, but at the same time, he's very clear on the difference, the, the, like the, the fundamental difference between like true criminality and, Mm -hmm. and human nature. So for instance, when he says that, um, um, so he's talking about some of the, or who is it? The bandit Giuliano. Um, when the bandit Giuliano, a thief and multiple murderer was hunted down in Sicily, a sense of condolence spread across the land An experiment in living a free life and the wild had failed. This touched every soul and the gray masses and only strengthened their sense of entrapment. This process leads to a heroizing of wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it creates, it also creates the ambiguous moral shadow that lies on all resistance movements and not only on them. So Giuliano was, uh, what was the story about him? He was this, um, I got the impression he was kind of like a, um, yeah, well, people have a sense of being under foreign occupation. And in this relation, the criminal appears a kindred soul. So yeah, the, the context here is he's talking about how, you know, when, when being oppressed by the, you know, by, a, by tyranny, the people, the people come to, like uh, come to feel for the criminal it's like because they're in a, a similar situation um and so when uh, does anyone it's remember kind of a, it's the zorro robin hood but oh, it's also well, this kind of unconscious well, projection of, yeah. of heroism mm -hmm. on, onto the criminal for lack of a better mm -hmm. uh heroic figure right like what, what was the, what was the what was the example um didn't we watch a movie a few years ago what was it um it was one of those, it was kind of like one of those old movies like Thelma and Louise or something, but it was about this, uh, maybe it was a TV show about this criminal who like the people loved and, uh, it's just vaguely, it's on the, I just barely, barely remember it. I think it was like set in maybe the fifties or something, but it's not just like a, like a Zorro or a Robin Hood because like those would be example. Well, those would be examples I think of, of people doing the right thing against a criminal, you know, a criminal mm -hmm. government. Yeah. But, and of course the, the government would call them criminals, but they're not, they're not actually criminals. Um, but, but the example of, well, I can't remember if he, if he mentioned Giuliano at some other point where he gave the details, but um, maybe not. But the, the impression I got with it, what is it? Was that it was kind of this, um, oh, I wish I could remember what that show was. Would it be more? It was basically more someone who had done to, like a someone who had uh, gone more, like on like a crime spree. Uh, maybe like a an Al Capone, like uh, yeah. gangster worship. Yeah, yeah, Godfather, that kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but oh, oh, it was um, oh, I remember that movie. It was the one about it had. Uh, Oh, no. I'm going to have to look it up. It was a movie that came out at, it just in the last five years. It was a crime movie. I think it took place in Texas. I think that the main characters were like Texas Rangers. Oh, yeah. With, 
Texas Rangers. Was it a historical drama? Yeah, or was but it not with Chris yeah. Pine? Uh, I don't think so. It was no. the. It, it was it took took place in. I'm pretty sure it was Texas Rangers, and it was these guys, and they were chasing these uh, these two criminals, like young young kids, young people, I think. And it was them them tracking them down, and it ended with this like gun battle, you know, a whole bunch of people getting shot, and uh, and these the the criminal that they were catching, like the the people would the people liked him or her, I can't even remember who it was, and would like. Um, you know, welcomed them into town, and do, do, do you guys not remember this? Oh, I'm going to have to look this up. <laughs> because that's what came to mind when I was thinking about this Giuliano guy. Um, yeah, but it again is just, uh, uh, while Harrison is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, enough, yeah, let him do his thing. It, uh, <laughs> uh, this speaks to the uh, to this ambivalence, right? That I talked about earlier about like the 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 of the moral order, you know, which has is good and it's it's bad sides, right? Because there is something uh, of a deeper moral order. Though I think the word natural law is a bit confusing uh, these days. Uh, because it had, as Harrison said, a specific meaning um, with Aquinas and 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 those um, medieval guys. Uh, but uh, the the word law these days has this connotation that it's basically a, a set of rules, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, we always talk about is does the natural law exist, you know? And then we think, oh, is there like a natural rule book, basically, right? So that's the association, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think uh, a lot of confusion uh, comes comes from that. Uh, and a lot of dispute because people then rightfully say, but there is no like law book or mm -hmm. like natural list of laws, you know, that doesn't exist. So, yeah, the, but if if we understand the term or as it was originally intended as something deeper that, uh, um, yeah, that has some kind of teleology in it uh, relates mm -hmm. to purpose, then uh, we can see that how, the, how there can be a conflict, right, between like the, the legal uh, thing that's going on in society like the the laws and and that deeper thing that deeper natural law and i think that's part of the fascination with the criminals right uh, with uh, with the movies and the mafia bosses and and all of that uh, i think the mafia boss is maybe an interesting case <laughs> because uh, uh, it's like they're both outside the law but then oftentimes it's portrayed like in the godfather as like uh, enacting the the natural law within you know the family and all of that and so yeah i think that that's part where, of where the fascination comes from mm -hmm. okay i found it it was the highwaymen with kevin costner and woody harrelson and it was about bonnie and clyde so it was about the mm. two ex-texas rangers oh that, yeah that were okay. that tried to hunt down and apprehend bonnie and clyde and so in that movie, the, you know, Bonnie and Clyde are really popular. People like them. And um, so there's that contrast between the, the lawmen trying to track down these popular criminals. And so that's that's who Giuliano brought to mind. And I have no idea who the bandit Giuliano was. Um, oh, well, I guess he says all we need to know, a thief and multiple murderer, right? So there's mm -hmm. this, this thief yeah. and multiple murderer who the people, uh, you know, the people are sad when he gets caught. Probably, you know, because... Because like the criminal, they are hunted down by the, you know, by the by the people. And I think Lobachevsky gets a bit more into, well, a, a lot more into the dynamic behind that. Um, he doesn't really mention this part of it, which is this kind of um, you know, sense of of shared uh, shared experience, you know, shared you know being on the same end of the, um, you know, the police baton. But in 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 Ponderology, he talks. It, it basically, it's the the first criterion of panerogenesis. It's the the lack of the the loss of the ability to recognize criminality or pathology as criminality or pathology, and to even um, to even heroize it and um, idolize it and you know lift it up on a pedestal. And so that's why. And and you see that today. I mean, like when I wrote. Um, when I wrote the, the footnotes for the book, I used the I used some examples, and there are like many more today than there there were just a few years ago when I when I wrote the examples. Like I, I used some examples from uh, like Antifa, 
about the the kind of criminals that are lion that are like martyred and seen as saints. So um, I can't rem- I can't remember any of their names because you know none of them are really worth remembering. But uh, you know a lot of like I said like murderers and murderers and thieves who uh, are part of Antifa who get uh, arrested or or who or who like die in a shootout or something and then they're held up as these at these as these saintly martyrs and we've seen several like saintly martyrs like that over the last few years who have just been you know just like low lives um like kind of the the lowest type of criminal you could imagine who are then held up as as if they were some kind of saints and it's 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 really weird phenomenon and uh and well Lobachevsky would say it has it's like a, a loss of uh a loss of that inner in um incorruptible evaluating consciousness so some people lose it other people don't other people other people don't but on that on that same subject of the of the criminal um well of the nature of orthocracy more generally he has a few other interesting things to say so for instance oh this is the, the this is the bit that i alluded to We live in times in which war and peace are difficult to distinguish from one another. Subtle shadings blur the borders between duty and crime. This can deceive even sharp eyes because the disorientation of the times, uh, the global guilt, spills over into the individual cases. The situation is aggravated aggravated by a lack of general sovereigns and by the fact that today's powerful have all arisen through the ranks of the factions the capacity for acts directed at the whole such initiatives as peace treaties decrees festivals donations and accretions is thereby impaired from the start instead the ruling powers intend to live off the whole they are incapable of adding to or even maintaining it from their own inner surplus through a gift of being in this manner, the triumphant factions squander the capital to sat to satisfy the pleasures and purposes of the day. Um, so this reminded me of what Lobachevsky wrote about the about pathocrats and and about psychopaths. That basically psychopaths don't can't do work and they don't want to do work and they basically want want to live in the world where they don't have to really do anything and everyone does everything for them and just gives them stuff. So it's essentially the, the parasites, um, you know, uh, the parasites way of life or the freeloader. And that's what, so that's what Younger's describing here. I thought he, I, I like the way he put it. They are incapable of adding to, or even maintaining it, the whole from their own inner surplus. So they have nothing to give, nothing to contribute to the world and that everything should be cr- contributed to them. So it's this inversion. Again, this is an inversion of like the, the natural order. The natural order is people yeah. and providing see, for the whole. And he says it's uh, that these are, are basically disconnected from being, right? Uh, by mm-hmm. which you, and that's, I found also like a quite interesting way of putting it uh, that uh, there are, not connected to the source and therefore cannot like like a good monarch or whatever you know whatever he had in mind as a contrast uh, to that uh, pitiful figure <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, who has risen through the factions uh, so like the the good uh, guy who is connected you know to to being to the wellspring and to his country and all of that uh, can actually produce a surplus as a as a ruler right so i thought that was a very good way of putting it i thought Mm -hmm. surplus and protection and you know at at at, um at the risk of uh repeating like what we've been saying especially with the show on um the great reset and and uh wef and the individuals who uh who are um, trying to accrue all of this power and financialize everything and create nothing and tell you that you'll be happy about it. You know, that this is really the reason why I think we're doing a third show on this slim volume. It's that in a very nuanced way, he is describing, uh, Junger is describing our 
situation right now. He's he is giving a a, a philosophical and and even poetic description of uh, what it is we're experiencing because he already he already tasted the flavor of it uh, in the in the time that he was living in and can see how uh, perennial these um, these behaviors and and policies were and you know it you know, he talks about you know Luke you just mentioned how disconnected these individuals are from from their source of being or from anything higher uh, and in such a blatant way we we get the very same messaging from the elite today who who will have us believe that there is nothing higher that than their own technocratic uh, ideals and and those things that they aspire to implement implement on a global scale. And uh, connected to that, here's another passage from Junger, where what he what he's really trying to do, uh, and I think throughout the whole book, is uh, empower the reader, the individual to see um, that their power does exist, uh, if, if only it's recognized for what it is. And, and not to, uh, to give away their, uh, their sense of sovereignty and their ability to act in some form or another uh, in the face of, of what is um, you know, oppression. So Junger writes, in our present age, each day can bring shocking new manifestations of oppression, slavery, or extermination, whether aimed at specific social groupings or spread over entire regions. Exercising resistance to this is legal as an assertion of basic human rights, which in the best cases are guaranteed in constitutions, but which the individual has nevertheless to enforce. So it's it's up to the individual to say, hey, you know what what you're doing here is unconstitutional. It's it's against some very basic human rights that I am arguing for with you right now. And reminds me of what uh, Grant said in our interview with him, where that was basically the position of the uh, of the army, where you really only had any constitutional rights if you sued them for it and fought for it. So I think. You know, Grant gave a good example of that very thing where he saw that the only way for these people, for people to have a, and assert their rights is to actually assert them. Yes. It's as if to say, if you're not taking ownership of mm -hmm. your sovereignty mm -hmm. and rights as an individual, then effectively you don't have them because mm -hmm. you don't believe that they exist. And you're, you're cutting yourself off from the mainspring of of true individuality and freedom. Mm -hmm. And so just to finish this paragraph, he says, effective forms exist to this end and those in danger must be prepared and trained to use them. This represents the main theme of a whole new education, familiarizing those in danger with the idea that resistance is even possible is already enormously important. Once that has been understood, even a tiny minority can bring down the mighty but clumsy Colossus. This is another image that constantly returns in history and provides its mythical foundations. Enduring buildings may then be erected on this base. And uh, again, bringing it around to uh, contemporary events and developments, um, you know, how many things are we reading these days where uh, someone who knows what the what the law is, who knows what their rights are, uh, is asserting them and suing this or that uh, institution uh, that that is seeking to uh, oppress individuals and tell them that um, they basically have no rights and and coerce them into doing things that are against their their conscience against their uh, higher nature. Uh, speaking of higher nature, just, I was, just one thing I wanted to mention because I found it kind of interesting. 
he said that uh, basically we can see that the times are that how bad the times are um in his day even uh because people talked about the the death of the soul right the the zealand toad um and uh, i found that uh, pretty interesting because it's not just um like a fight for rights and all of that which is uh, part of it but it has gotten so bad that uh that people start talking about like, <clears throat> basically souls souls die uh, souls being killed so not only the uh the, the humans like human oppression but literally like souls being killed mm -hmm. even though he says um because this whole thing goes back to rudolf steiner and uh, the death of the soul but uh, he says no i mean we, we're still immortal and, and we should realize that because then we we cannot really be controlled as much right if we realize that our soul is immortal it cannot be really uh, it cannot really be destroyed but uh, he saw that as a sign of the times that um that this idea was even took took root right uh, that that's how bad how bad it really is mm -hmm. yeah they translated it, it as to... soul murder in, in yeah. yeah and i was going to follow up with uh just a a little passage on that very thing because i was thinking about that too uh luke because it was an interesting expression that i hadn't uh countered encountered before um soul murder um but then you know he he says anyone who has any idea about like immortality uh if you think that it is possible in any sort of sense then such a, a term is uh objectionable um but then he goes on to say that um the panic so widely observable today is the expression of an emaciated spirit of a passive nihilism that provokes its active counterpart of course no one is easier to terrorize than the person who believes that everything is over when his fleeting phenomenon is extinguished the new slaveholders have realized this and this explains the importance for them of materialistic theories which serve to shatter the old order during the insurrection and to perpetuate the reign of terror afterward no bastion is left to is to be left standing where a man may feel unassailable and therefore unafraid mm -hmm. and so that you know that that speaks to you know like elon what you were saying you know you could tie this into all the kind of goings on of of the day with the onslaught of the of the materialistic science against all that could be seen as uh supernatural or paranormal or uh anything beyond pure pure materialistic uh mechanicality um all of that is and must be torn down and then never talked about again it's just no it's wrong we can't talk about it because they know that it's bullshit um because if we have those kinds of conversations then the, the immortal spirit of man which cannot die a death except by our own lack of use or lack of um invigorating embodiment um, you know, if that's the only way that you can really die, then, you know, what's, what's a little, um, what's a little time in a gulag compared to, uh, the death of my own spirit by giving into, um, and conforming to whatever dictates of, of the times, uh, that I see coming, like if, if it's re-education camps forever for me for not, uh, using someone's preferred pronoun. <clears throat> well, yeah, and this, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Luke. Well, just this brings me, uh, to thinking back about what we were discussing earlier on how individuals are, um, taking the place of, uh, uh or filling in for, uh, the the brittleness or dissolution or degradation of institutions that were formerly um, part of uh, invigorating the the spiritual uh, and moral life of individuals, uh, the religious institutions, the churches, uh, the the places that would 
um, seek to make civil life and uh, and 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 support individuals um, culturally um, and traditionally, and how there's not only this kind of degradation that's occurring uh, be because it because it's not led by individuals who have this kind of inner moral compass. Um, but it's also being, I would say, overtly attacked. And just to bring this around to uh, some of the trends that we're seeing globally, you know, we have these, these centuries old uh, religious institutions in Ukraine, uh, in Europe, um, uh, in the US that are either being burned down or, uh, or closed down uh, by the authorities um, in, in unusually, in, in incredible numbers where you, you have to wonder, well, you don't wonder, you know, it's statistically impossible. I mean, there, there are concerted efforts, however covert, to, to destroy these institutions. And in the West, and particularly in the U.S., you have churches that are subverted by uh, the tranny movement, and 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 having uh, their leaders embrace all kinds of um, you know far left uh, ideologies. Uh, so we're seeing it on that front, and you know it, it just reminds me of of things we've <laughs> read to bring this to an even uh, more aggressive and overt level. Uh, some years back, we were discussing on the show um, a book about NATO called the, the Globalization of NATO and how one of their mandates, um, except it wasn't, it wasn't in the writing, it wasn't under responsibility to protect, it was nothing, it was nothing stated that way. But one of their policies, one of the things that, that was a part of what they did is to not only destroy the infrastructure of a particular nation that, that they wanted to attack, but to, to ground to rubble the churches, the schools, uh, all, of the, all of the places that made the, the culture and the society of that country under attack what it was, all of those places that would make the individual feel unassailable, uh, to bring it around to what you read. Uh, where there was no refuge, you you were you were not only denied uh, shelter and food and safety, you were denied you know the very um, uh, immaterial uh, soul strengthening institutions and support uh, that might help you get through such a such a crushing experience. So uh, those are some of the things I've been. Uh, came to mind when when reading uh yeah these maybe last that's few a good parts. segue to um to the last bit he discusses namely language um because uh he said in an interview with french tv that i watched uh, a while ago uh, he said uh, uh only le poète peut sauver le monde maintenant only a poet can save the world now right or only the poets uh can save the world. And he said something similar in, in Forest Passage, um, that's basically the role of the, I mean, the poet is the most important guy, right? And and by poet, I suppose he, he doesn't mean just, you know, um, writing poems or something like that, but uh, like in a more general sense, um, the the word, basically the, 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 the written word, the spoken word, things like that, uh, spoken like from a true spirit, spirit from true being uh and uh i um as you said you know when when you destroy like schools and and churches and and that kind of thing it's it is basically it's literally destroying that uh, that ability right that the only way to to save the world and he um he has this theory um I mean, there there was always this dispute, right, between historians. Uh, what drives history? Is it like uh, the material world, or like Marx thought? You know, materialism. It's basically the economic conditions and all those hard hard facts and hard interests that drive history. And and then there's those that 
emphasize more the role of ideas um, and uh, and communication. Uh, and Jünger clearly said, uh, is of the opinion that uh, the word is what drives the world primarily, right? The the world the, the world of ideas. Um, uh, he says uh, it's uh, now exactly how it formulated. It. Maybe one of you has the passage handy, but uh, he basically said um, that that's that, that is primary. Um, and I found that his discussion about language at the end really good um, and uh, really hopeful also um, because uh, uh, in his view, language can has these incredibly deep roots and they connect us to like our entire heritage, our everything. And he says, even in the in times where where it's like totally uh, destroyed, um, where the language gets like bureaucratized, right, and, like, and dead and pale and and whatever, that even then uh, the the true poet can suddenly spring from the like a what was this word like a lion uh, coming a from lion the, desert. the desert, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and I found that a, a really uh, hopeful. Uh, image and 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 one thing you also said and and that reminded me very much uh, about our situation we find ourselves in today. Um, he says uh, um, and and in the in the, in the language in a state where the language is like so bureaucratized and like uh, dead uh, and and so on, um, they try to to pretend it is fresh by adopting like the basically the the dial or the the language of marginalized groups, um, and he he means like uh, criminals and uh, uh, some like um, out outlaws, basically um, things like that. Um, and I think that's uh, that's kind of interesting because in our culture today, uh, language is also in many ways uh, dead and and technical and uh, very much in, like it's like this whole business gobbledygook and academic uh, gobbledygook and all those different gobbledygooks right so it's, it's like really uh, uh not not pretty um all that and very um stale uh but then they try to li liven it up you know by bringing in like weird words from marginalized groups right so that that is an aspect they kind of pretend that there is a freshness a coolness to it a hipness when it's like really totally dead and it's just gobbledygook basically um, but you know, as Jünger says, uh, it is in it. It is no. Uh, there is no correlation between the state of the langu of a language and the possibility of true po poetry arising. Mm -hmm. So I found that a really, really hopeful thing, and I think we can see some of that already happening. Uh, but what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to read that. Um, what I think might be some of the things that you. You were talking about the primal, the primal aspect of of language, how they translated it here. Um, it starts. The first is just just before the final section. He says, "A very significant event here is philosophy's turn from knowledge to language. It brings the spirit back into close contact with a primal phenomenon. This is more important than any physical discovery. The thinkers and the thinker enters a field." in which an alliance is finally possible again with the theologian and with the poet. So there's something primal, uh, something primal about, about language and that, it, so, um, I mean, it was the, like the analytic philosophers, right. Who, who got into like linguistic yeah. logic Linguist, and all these things. Yeah. And so, so he's saying that, well, actually that there's a, there's a sign of hope in that, even if they went off in like this weird direction, that was a, you know, there's something, something about that. I think, you know, Chris Lang would, would probably say the same thing is that it's very interesting that the, they turned towards language. They just didn't take it far enough, right? They, they didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't, they didn't analyze the, uh, the ontological implications of their own linguistic theories that there is something like much deeper about the the reality of language and what it says about the, the structure of reality. And that's what Jünger actually kind of gets to at the, at the beginning of the last section, uh, 34. Um, so um, he's talking about examples where <clears throat> there's genuine contact with being. And he says that 
these these examples, these instances, they represent investitures with primal creative power, which manifests itself in time. It says this also becomes apparent in language. Um, skip a bit. I like this. As light makes the world and its forms visible, so language makes their inner nature comprehensible and is indispensable as a key to their treasures and secrets. So language is like light and that it brings, it, it, it makes comprehensible the inner nature, which is the essence of things. So it's actually through language that we're able to come into contact with reality and to understand reality. Language is essentially the structure of our, the structure of our thought, the structure of our experience and the structure of our knowledge. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and and then to, I may, to yeah, finish, go ahead. Uh, I want just uh, one wanna, point about the, the analytic philosophy thing. J it just occurred to me because I had the analytic philosophy thing also in mind when I read that passage, uh, because that's usually like the, the linguistic third in philosophy and, and all of that. But um, he might be talking also about the continental tradition in that sense because they were also big on on language right and and they had a a bit more of a maybe a more mystical um uh approach uh, like you know even the frankfurt school like uh, the walter benjamin and and these guys uh, and heidegger of course i mean uh, jünger was uh, a friend basically of of heidegger's um and uh so and and lay, there's also this like postmodern tradition you know talking about language mm -hmm. and uh and where even some i uh have even suggested you know that language cannot really be explained without telepathy or something like that so it's it was uh there's that tradition as mm -hmm. well so just occurred to me that maybe he's talking also about that aspect of philosophy. yeah you're probably you're probably right <laughs> No, but I, I uh, understood it like you did before too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think both of those, uh, you know, are likely true to whatever extent he may have been aware of it at the time. I think the implications are are there nonetheless. And I think, and I don't remember if you you said this, Harrison. Uh, the the sentence that followed, uh, "Law mm -hmm. and dominion begin in the visible and even in the invisible realms with the act of naming." So once you can name a thing, you can, by implication, understand it. Mm -hmm. um, or in the process of giving it a name, you first must understand it. You know, it's a bit of a, you know, goes both ways kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, that that in and of itself is, is enough to, well, it ties in with a lot of like esoteric traditions um, with the power of names and having the you know, even in demonology, like you can control the demon if you only know its name. Um, that that idea that names are important, language is important, and it is it's fundamentally built in into, in some way that is very important. And if only we can grasp how that is, that we can really unlock some deep and important truths, which I think Langan, you know has mm -hmm. done quite a bit in uh, moving in that direction. Yeah. Well, well, the very next sentence after the mm -hmm. two that you guys <laughs> read is another gem. <laughs> the word is the material of the spirit and as such serves to build the boldest bridges. At the same time, it is the supreme instrument of power. You know, the, the pen is mm -hmm. mightier than the sword, anyone? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's so great that he ends the book uh, discussing language as this medium, um, this this material of spirit medium from which we uh, gain power. Um, not not power in the uh, totalitarian Unlimited sense, power. but in the in the sovereign uh, individual uh, sense, um, and uh, really really kind of was a great reminder for, you know, why you guys are, are so uh, rigorous about your substacks and, and why we have certain authors who understand this at, at an intrinsic level. Uh, why Peterson is, is so prolific. I mean, the, the guy comes out with two or three videos every week because he understands that 
that meaning and uh, empowerment is conveyed and transferred and um, induced through the medium of language, through speech, through the written word. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing, expanding on the sentence that that Adam read about naming. I'll just get the phrase again. That um, yeah, law and dominion begin. Okay, with the act of naming. So, what is the act of naming? Um, yeah, I liked what you said about it, Adam. And another way of putting that, I would say, is that um, in or in order to to perceive something or to understand it, we need to be able to differentiate it from its its environment, from the context that surrounds it. We need to be able to identify it to understand you know, what it is, what its identity is. And so that's that identity that is essentially, I think, the same thing as naming it. So when it is named, um, that's essentially saying what it is in contrast to all the things that it is not. So, and and that's a function of language. Function Like language is, it builds the, it, it um, it builds and recognizes the boundaries of things. Without those boundaries, we wouldn't be able to identify one thing or differentiate it from another. So that's it's tied in with this aspect of identity and um, what it means to be something. Um, and that you know launches into like um, information theory and a bunch of other things. But just just how um, just how fundamental that that concept of naming is and what does it actually mean to to have a name to be named something well it's to be it's to to be able to be identified um, to be given an identity and to be recognized by other things with identities and for everything to interact and to know each other and so the the act of naming like the which you know in theological terms is you know, God speaking a word and and that that word taking shape and uh, giving being and and giving identity to the to the thing thus named. Um, that is how the 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 universe, which is an expression, you know, an expression of the divine of of God's will. That's how it interacts with each other. That's how we come to know God, each other. Everything is through this um, through this process of this linguistic process of knowing, of um, knowing and experiencing, um, which is kind of a uh, rambling and you know not totally fully formed thought, but uh, just so, just how I was thinking about that when you were talking about it. And unless you guys have any other thoughts, we could end it there. Did you have anything else? Except no. to say that I'm glad we finally discussed some good German literature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we spent so much time knocking down all the bad stuff. We had to get someone good. Yeah, yeah it's a good thing you found you found a good one finally. There's at least at least one good German to talk <laughs> about. <right? laughs> it took took me ten years. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank okay. You. Well, unless there's anything else. And we'll sign off. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>